Okay, hello everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Before I get started, I'd like to ask you guys if you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate. Let's try and make this interactive. Um, it will probably be more interesting for you guys and for me. So, without further ado, I'm going to be talking about um, Stratoscale and our system, and in particular, how we grew the development of the system um, from two founders to 54 developers as of yesterday and growing. Okay, this is about, this is a story about our journey and um, the DevOps related aspects of it, of course. So, to give you guys context, this is not a product pitch. Um, if you want a product pitch, come to our table later and I'll give you the full product pitch, that's not a problem. This is just to put what I'll talk about in context. So what does Stratoscale do? We are building private clouds, or more accurately, operating systems for private clouds. You buy a bunch of servers, anywhere from one server to um, several racks of servers. You install our operating system, based on Linux, of course, on those servers, and you get a full-featured private cloud. Um, you get a compute layer, you get a storage layer, you get a networking layer, you get the cloud management that wraps all of this together. We're building software for private clouds, okay? Unlike a lot of um, stuff that I expect we'll be talking about during this conference, our software runs on the customer's premise. This is a private cloud, okay? This is for people who want something like Amazon except in their own data center. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, a little bit about the company. It was founded in early 2013. Um, we've grown in the last two and a half, three years from two founders to 70 plus people, 54 of them developers. Um, we have a bunch of different expertise in different areas. Uh, we raised a bunch of money, blah, blah, blah. That's not important. Okay, the important thing is um, we're on a growth trajectory. So what is this talk about? This talk is about scaling, and in particular, how do you scale your development and operations and testing? Um, how do you scale the people? How do you scale the processes, the systems that you use to do this? Um, how we scaled every aspect of the company, pretty much. Again, to put it in context, this is not your, often when we talk about DevOps, we're talking about complex web applications, um, multi-tier, but they all have some things in common. Um, our system is different because it's built from the ground up. Um, we have our own memory management at a hypervisor layer. Um, we have remote memory in the system, software-based remote memory, enabling one node to access another node's memory. We have our own scale-out distributed storage uh, um, subsystem written in C++. Okay, this is very much not a web application. Um, this stuff, it's all written in C and in assembly. Okay, that raises all sorts of interesting challenges when you come to um, developing, testing, and operating, and, de and deploying and operating it. We have, of course, the um, cloud management stack and our own um, clustering layers. So this is a big distributed system, and that raises a whole slew of different ch challenges. Um, there's the management aspects, the UI, UX aspects, and this is all just one big system. So how do you develop, test, deploy, operate, run it? As I mentioned, many different aspects. And when the company said, this was our vision from day one, um, whereas other companies might pick just one of these aspects and build a product around that, we decided to do everything. Um, we are very fond of when asking, should we do this or should we do that? We should, um, the answer is often, let's do both. So we're trying to do all of this. And in the context of the development system, we want all of it to be developed as a single system. And I'll talk about some of the implications of that in a bit. 
So let's talk about the beginning. In the beginning, there were anywhere from zero to 10 developers. We used a single Git repository for all of the company's source code. The kernel bits, the storage bits, the networking bits, the cloud management bits um, in Python, in our case, mostly, although not necessarily, the UI bits, all of it in a single Git repository. We were um, very focused on testing and on deploying stuff very quickly um, in an automated manner from the get-go. We initially used Atlassian Bamboo for our continuous integration and continuous delivery. How many of you, um, I'm just curious, how many of you use it or have used it? Okay, not too many. Um, we don't use it anymore. <laughs> Through no fault of Bamboo, it just wasn't a very good fit for us um, when it came to the kernel bits in particular. It's pretty good for stuff that's higher up in the stack, but um, our kernel developers really did not get the experience that we were looking for when using um, Bamboo and SoftLayer um, for continuous integration and delivery and testing. So that was what we started with. Um, it didn't pan out, as I mentioned. So uh, you know, the company has grown a little bit by that time. And um, we figured out, you know, why don't we write our own CI system? How hard can it be? Um, and that's what we set out to do. And we were sure, you know, we're on the promised road. We're going to get to Shangri-La. It's going to be awesome. And uh, in fact, it was pretty good. This is what it looked like. And every time I look at this, this brings back a lot of memories. La, it's a bit too small on this monitor. You guys probably can't read it. Um, but let me tell you guys what we are seeing here. You're seeing a web application running on a server in our data center that's continuously monitoring our single Git repository for branches that have either pull request or push request as a prefix in the name. Every such branch, um, once it is found, is automatically run through, um, at the point of time when this uh, screenshot was taken, we had 95 different integration tests. I'll talk about unit tests and white box tests in a bit, these are integration tests. So every such branch is run through the 95 different tests. Um, and if it passes all of them, it is automatically committed to the tree and becomes the new head of the tree um, that everyone's supposed to rebase themselves against. Just, show, just so um, you know, I get a better feel for you guys, when I talk about rebasing and pull requests, is this Chinese to many of you? Or are we all on the same page when it comes to Git? OK, this is the technical track. I'm not showing you guys any code, but uh, I'm taking some liberties. So um, pull requests go automatically into the tree. They run through, uh, the tests are run automatically. If they pass, everything's great, right? That was the vision. And um, any change that any developer makes that passes the testing is automatically committed. Sounds great, right? Unfortunately, let me tell you guys what happened when we grew. Okay? This worked pretty well for a time, or maybe I'm just being nostalgic, but I think it worked pretty well for a time. Um, but when we grew, things just burst at the seams. Um, you can see some hints of trouble to come even here. Let me go over them. See this list up here? That's, um, by the way, this was taken, as it happens, a couple of these pull requests are mine. And uh, I seem to recall I sent them pretty late at night. Um, so we're talking about uh, a late hour in the day. And we're, we have, um, what is it, seven pull requests just waiting to be tested. Now, the testing that we did at this point in time, we didn't have a data center. We didn't have a lot of iron, a lot of servers. So um, everything here ran, remember, our system is a cluster of bare metal nodes. But since we didn't have enough clusters and big enough clusters, everything here ran in virtual machines. Each virtual machine 
standing for a bare metal node. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are familiar with KVM, this, um, everything, our system and everything I'm talking about here is based on KVM. So for those of you who are familiar with KVM, you should probably be thinking right now, oh no, nested virtualization. Okay? Uh, nested virtualization, which I was involved in developing in a previous life um, while at IBM Research, uh, I think this, this might have been one of the biggest uses of um, nested virtualization to do something concrete, and we ran into all sorts of problems um, that you don't expect to run into while building a CI system, lost interrupts, okay? Um, a colleague of mine spent two weeks hunting for why an interrupt, which happened to be pretty important, got lost. Um, we found it, by the way. So, tests are running slowly, tests are failing because of artifacts of the environment, the fact that we're running in a nested virtualization environment. Um, tests are failing, pull requests don't go in. Pull requests don't go in, developers who are convinced their code is perfect, and in many cases were actually right. It's the CI system that's failing tests, it's not the tests that are failing. Um, they just send their pull requests again and again. This causes load, load, this causes delays, okay? This causes frustration, lots and lots of frustration. Um, we're seeing here, for example, that the last um, build that actually succeeded was actually a push request. We had a mechanism um, wielded by select few, such as Rotem here, to bypass the whole system. Because sometimes, you know, the computer is wrong, the person is right, and this code should actually go in. And when you have such a bypass mechanism, you know that you're, you have problems. So, in, more, um, uh, in a more structured way, once we got around 20 developers, um, the build times were long and getting longer. Um, we're talking about, I think, an hour and a half um, for one build to run all of the tests that order of magnitude. Um, we had multiple build types trying to speed things up. Maybe we'll just do partial builds, let's do caching, let's do all sorts of things um, that you shouldn't do unless you have to. Um, the rapid growth of the company caused um, a bunch of artifacts in the way that people were improving the CI system, um, just not being aware of what was done before. I mentioned that at this stage, all of our bare metal nodes were actually running in virtual machines. We had templates of these virtual machines to speed up instantiating nodes, because before a test could run, you had to build up a cluster. So that was obviously an important part of the cycle. Um, initially, we had a single template, but then people needed new templates, and it was easier to create their own templates, which were subtly different than the original templates, but identical in every other way, and use that, and we ended up, I think, with five or maybe more um, vanillas, and that was a problem because it started being a big, unmaintainable mess. Another issue with the single Git repository um, approach that we had is that uh, we had this mentality. We had a lot of interesting um, mental quirks that I can't go into in this um, polite company, but buy me a beer sometime and I'll tell you all about it. Um, but one of the quirks that I can talk about is this, everyone is an owner, okay? Everyone should feel ownership of every part of the code. You know what this translates to? It translates to no one is an owner, okay? Ownership is not so easy. And if you say everyone's an owner, and you know, you have a deadline, you have this critical fix that you want to get in, you have this feature that you really, really want to put into the code, and uh, you just found a problem in some other part, you're not thinking, oh, I own that as well. You're thinking someone else will fix it. And that's not a, that's not a good way to build systems. Um, and the last issue is that, again, single Git repository, every aspect of the system is built um, in the same way changes in one part, unless you're very strict about modularity and um, building components with the right levels of abstraction, um, which we, to be honest, 
were not. We were not as rigorous as we should have been and as we are today. Um, you get into cascading changes. Okay? Someone makes a change in one place, supposedly completely unrelated to some other thing, but that other thing just broke. And that happened a lot. So, at this point in time, um, one of our key developers, Shlomi Matichin, who's not here today, but is an awesome guy, um, started thinking, you know, what we have right now, um, that's a shed, pretty much, okay? Machsan. What we want is a skyscraper. We want we're growing, we're constantly growing. This is not a foundation that we can build on, what we had. Um, how do you build the tools, the processes, the testing to enable you to build a skyscraper, to grow um, in an order of magnitude? Um, so what we did, what Shlomi mostly did initially and then others joined into the effort, um, is to build, first of all, a set of tools for 50 plus developers. As I mentioned, today we're 54 developers, and here we're talking about a year or a year and a half ago. So the first thing Shlomi did, Shlomi is a great guy, but he really likes to invent things, which sometimes that's exactly what you need. Um, he built a bunch of tools first. He built an rsync replacement because rsync wasn't good enough. And I'm happy to say that when he came to me and said, you know, rsync is not good enough, I said, what the hell are you talking about? But then he showed me that for a bunch of stuff that we needed to rsync for our specific use cases, when we were building um, the file systems of our cluster nodes, rsync actually spent a lot of time where if you combine some concepts from Git, the concepts of objects and diffs between objects, um, you could actually speed that up a lot. So that's a tool called Osmosis. Um, you can think of it as an rsync replacement without getting into the details. Solvent is built on top of Osmosis and is a build artifact repository. Okay? It knows how to use the Osmosis protocol. Um, so Osmosis is at the level of objects. Solvent is at the, levels, is at the level of files. Okay? So Solvent, you basically say, I want version 17 of some specific component of our system. Maybe it's an executable, maybe it's a daemon, maybe it's an RPM package, maybe it's a Docker container, maybe it's, um, maybe it's a library, whatever. And Solvent will get you that version very, very quickly. By the way, I didn't mention it, but our system runs both uh, virtual machines and containers. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a bit. Okay. Inaugurator is a tiny Linux image. Um, the way that our machines, and it doesn't matter right now if these are virtual machines or bare metal servers, the way that they work in our testing environment is that the inaugurator is the first thing that boots, and then it talks with the object and file repository and basically brings that system to the state that you want it to be in to run a specific test or to run a specific set of tests. So that's the inaugurator. Um, we also built a tool called Upsetto. Um, the reason why it's called Upsetto is because we had a tool called Distrato. So Shlomi was distraught with Distrato and he built Upsetto. Um, yeah, don't ask. Upsetto, um, there's a big difference between what the vision was and what ended up happening in the end. In the end, we used it mostly as a Git submodel replacement or a repo replacement. For those of you who are not familiar with these concepts, we wanted to take this one big Git repository and break it up into multiple repositories for various reasons. Now, this is not, um, this is not a must. For example, I don't know uh, how many of you have seen it, but it recently came out that Google uses a single large repository for all company source code. Okay? Single large repository. Of course, that repository is carved up and split in various different ways, but it is still a single repository. We decided to do something that's more uh, traditional, I would say, and have just multiple models, uh, multiple Git repositories for different aspects of the code. This is probably a good time to mention that um, these tools and many other are actually available on GitHub. We've open sourced them. This is not our product. 
this is just the stuff that we use for our infrastructure for developing and testing and operating and running our product. Let me see what time it is. Okay, we're good. Um, we ditched our homegrown CI system and switched to, how many of you are familiar with this? Most of you. We switched to Jenkins, like pretty much everyone else. Um, so this is the, our Jenkins server, which runs a whole bunch of jobs to do a whole bunch of different things. Most importantly, it enables you, through some other bits that I'll talk about in a bit, it enables you to spawn up um, clusters of various sizes with specific versions of our software and then run a bunch of scenarios on them. And we use this capability for continuous integration and continuous delivery so that we always run, in addition to a bunch of other things, the latest bits of our code on the system. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Jenkins, you know that it has agents or slaves. Because we're big believers in eating our own dog food, um, our Jenkins slaves and everything related to Jenkins runs on the Stratascale system. Obviously, we don't update it every day. We try to keep to the stable version, um, but it's running. As of, uh, as of the last time I looked, it was running uh, for several weeks without any particular issues. Um, and this is extremely important to us, that all the stuff that we use internally runs on our own stuff. I want to talk about testing for a bit, and then I'll talk about um, another aspect. It became obvious that if we want to scale the development uh, process, we want to develop more stuff faster, we have to be more rigorous when it comes to testing. So we employ four different kinds of testing methodologies. We do unit tests for the function or class level, um, basically just making sure that a bunch of code does what it is supposed to do in isolation. We use white box testing. Um, our system is composed of multiple demons. They do a bunch of different things. Um, you can think of it as a microservice architecture, although many, many of our demons are not micro, they're actually macro, uh, big instead of small but we're working on that. Um, so white box testing are used to test a daemon in isolation using mocks of other objects or daemons so that we don't have to test everything together. Um, we use something called Voodoo that you can also look up on GitHub that I won't go into for lack of time. We run subsystem tests on each of our different subsystems. There's a bunch of kernel-specific tests, hypervisor-specific tests, memory-specific tests, um, storage-specific tests. These test features, okay, things for, um, such as, for example, our remote memory, there would be a bunch of subsystem tests that test just that specific aspect of the system. Um, they also test how well parts are integrated with other parts of the system. And of course, we have system tests that um, do end-to-end -end testing, usually using our API or CLI or our web UI, just running user scenarios on the entire system. So four different um, types of tests to cover as much as possible every aspect of the system. Now, we, it became obvious that as we grow both the company and the scale of the system, and um, I don't think I mentioned this, but our late, latest release, which is out now, supports up to 100 nodes. Our next release will support up to 1,000 nodes. Um, it became obvious that you know, running testing at that scale in nested virtual machines, that wasn't going to fly. So the la la last part of our tool stack is something we call the rack attack. Okay? Rack attack is a system for very quickly allocating, provisioning, and then reclaiming bare metal servers. Um, this is pretty awesome. You run a command, and five seconds later, um, you have a bunch of servers, as many as you want. I'll talk about the scale uh, in a bit. You have a bunch of servers that have been allocated for your use. Our system, Rack Attack, automatically installs a specific version of our system on those servers, and then you can start using it. Okay. Um, 
It is using all the other parts of that. Dev stack that I mentioned, such as osmosis and solve with an inaugurator. Um, and this is what it looks like. Um, this is from yesterday during the day when I was preparing these slides. What we're seeing here is that we have five racks in the system right now. Each rack has approximately 64 servers, if I recall correctly. So this is 300 some servers. Um, at this point in time, 73 of them are actually free. The rest of them are allocated for various purposes, mostly running tests. Okay? Of course, there is a way to log into the systems, see what's going on, debug them, etc. But uh, the cool bits here are that you just run a command line and you get an allocation of as many servers as you need. Um, for example, this job, which is one of our CI jobs, um, we're seeing here, again, sorry, this is a bit small, um, we're seeing here that it has a bunch of different servers. These eight servers, these are their IPs. You can log into them, et cetera. Yes? Excellent question. So for networking, no, we do not assume a flat networking space. Our system um, also has a networking component, which means we expect um, virtual machines and containers to be running in their own networks. We have um, the necessary bits in Rack Attack to give each of these environments its own isolated network environment so that you can run uh, networking related functionality on it. With regards to storage, um, our system comes with a built-in distributed storage layer, which is what most of this uses. Um, and then each of the serve, um, sorry, each of the disks or SSDs on the machines you have been allocated is for your use. Our storage subsystem runs on them and makes all of the storage space available to the rest of the cluster, just like it would uh, in the field. Other questions? Feel free. Yes. Sorry, though, just a second. There is some similarity with, um, with Mesos, with Kubernetes, with Nomad. Um, I could explain the differences and why we're much better, but then I would be verging into product pitch category, so let's uh, talk about that outside, okay? You wanted to ask something else, though? About networking? Yeah. Okay, so um, first of all, yes. In the version that we've just released, we're relying on VLANs, physical VLANs. Um, the next version will support VXLAN and other such um, encapsulation protocols, um, NVGRE, et cetera. We can talk about this more later. Okay, so are we good? We're at the scale of 50 plus developers right now. Um, we've, we have really fast develop, test, deploy on a real cluster, run, debug, et cetera, cycles on the order of minutes. Um, we can provision bare metal and virtual um, test environments very quickly. Developers get rapid test feedback. That's pretty awesome. Um, and we have a bunch of automated tools for developing, testing, operating our systems. Um, and of course, importantly, a lot of this is running on our own systems. So that's all good, right? No, because it's a long road to scaling um, a product in a company such as ours. What we have right now works pretty well for 50, 50 something developers, um, but we're actually aiming at a two orders of magnitude increase in scaling. Why two orders? Um, we're aiming for 200 plus developers in the next, uh, in the near term. Um, as I mentioned, our next release will support up to 1,000 nodes. That's a lot of developers running a lot of big clusters. So that's a challenge. How do we support that without... Um, hold on a second. Ah. I think I lost a slide. Okay, um, this is actually one of our racks in our data center. Okay, we have several of these. How do we grow to, 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 okay, I'm going in the wrong direction. That's why I'm not finding the slide that I want. Uh, 
yeah. So how do we grow to this uh, scale without you know, becoming um, a large data center operator, which is not the business that we're in? It's a question that we're thinking about a lot. Um, we need better API definitions between components. As the system grows, it becomes more and more important to have well-defined APIs and boundaries between different components. Um, we're very, very focused on testing. I like to say, if it's not tested, it's broken. Okay? It's that simple. Someone comes to me and says, it works. I'm asking, is it tested? If it's not tested, it's broken. I don't care you know, how much you think that it works. Um, even when it's tested, if the coverage not, is not high enough, if you didn't um, cover all of the test, all of the interesting cases that you could run into, um, we talked about tools like, a, like a Jespen or Jepsen, I don't remember exactly the name, um, in the previous talk. It's really easy to break stuff, unfortunately, even without trying very hard. Um, we need, the, as the development organization grows, you need better best practices. Um, you have a lot of talented people, but they're not all talented in the same things. So how do you make all of them really good at what you need them to do? You, we need even more continuous integration and delivery. Um, in particular, and I'm sort of mixing here on internal environments and what our product does, but we would like to be able to continuously update our cloud, just like you expect from public clouds, but our clouds run on the customer's premise. Okay? We have limited access. Um, there are different expectations. How do, you, how do you do that? That's a challenge that we're looking into. And of course, the whole concept of serviceability, both for our internal systems and for the systems that uh, we're selling, um, that's an ongoing effort. So these are just some of the challenges that we have. Um, and in conclusion, Scaling up is hard to do, but it's a great sense of accomplishment if you succeed, and then you move on to the next problem. We've found in our personal experience that different approaches work best for different stages of growth. You don't do the, the same thing for one developer as you do for 10 or for 100. It's pretty obvious, but um, there's a strong tendency to just go with, uh, with what you've got but it's not the right thing to do. You need to continuously invest. Um, testing is crucial, and I hope I've shown, to some small extent, that DevOps, it's not just for web apps, okay? You can apply the concepts of DevOps in many, many different areas. So, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much. In case it wasn't obvious, we're hiring, and you're more than welcome to come and talk to me or Pavel or Rotem um, outside uh, at our table. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys have. Um, excellent question. So it, de it differs between unit testing, for example, where coverage might be lines of code, obviously. Um, but for system testing, for example, taking the other side of the spectrum, we try to define as many different scenarios as we think are interesting. And then we pick which ones we cover, the most important ones. And having done that, we know that we haven't covered nearly as much as we think we have. Okay? Um, there are, as I mentioned in a, in a previous life, I used to work at IBM Research, we had a whole department looking um, from an academic perspective at that particular question. How do you define coverage? How do you, um, in a bounded effort, okay? I have this many CPU cycles, I have this many man hours. How do I um, not just increase my coverage, but get the best coverage? And uh, it's an open question. So like I expect most of you guys, um, we're aware of what's the, um, What's the state of the art? And then we, we do what we can. Any other questions? Yes. OK, so um, different approaches for different growth stages. When we had our own CI system, we actually had, um, when a test failed, run it five times 
If four of them pass and one fail, call that a pass. Because maybe there were timing issues, maybe there was a network blip, maybe the nested virtualization screwed us up, whatever. Okay? Um, now, when the company has grown and our um, environment is much better and much more stable, if it fails, then it's probably the system's fault, not the tests or the environment's problem. So we don't rerun it um, again. The developer gets some sort of feedback. Hey, your test failed. And then it will just run again in the next cycle. And we'll see. And we, of course, track this so that we see which tests have sporadic failures. Um, if a test is failing constantly, we either take it out or fix it, obviously. Take it out if it's no longer relevant. That happened a few times. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. the yes. System. Short answer is yes. How fast? Minutes. 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 Yeah. By the way, um, if you guys want a demo, we can try and put one together outside. With pleasure. OK, we'll break here. I don't want to be what's uh, left between you guys and lunch. So thank you very much. And uh, bon appetit.